Good morning, traders and investors. Welcome back to another episode of Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. I'm Aaron Bree. We got Dennis Dick hanging out backstage. Uh, got a lot to talk about. We're back in earnings season yesterday. Big red day again, the second day in a row, seeing that VIX creep higher. Uh, maybe a little, getting, come, coming down a little bit today, but we'll talk about that. We'll see if today, you know, are, are we going to break out? Is this a buy the dip? Or is this a fake out? We will be talking about that. We've got earnings to break down. United Healthcare, Bank of America, Johnson & Johnson. Some big some big boys, some big companies. Uh, let's go ahead and get the show started. I'll bring Dennis on when we get back. Welcome to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. This is a volatile puppy here. It's all about execution style and strategies. All right, S and P five hundred trading slightly higher this morning, up a buck forty two, about three tenths of a percent. Let's go over to the Qs, uh, up a little bit less, 0.17 percent right now. Let's go over to the DIA is up 0.64 percent. The Dow leading so far today in pre market trading. Uh, IWM can ne can never just you know IWM is doing its little thing as the unloved stepchild of the market just can never get a bid when when all the other indices are down three tenths of a percent what's getting what's gotten hit is getting hit again this morning i'm sorry small cap investors that's just the way it's been uh let's go to bitcoin down uh to sixty three thousand. Uh, i mean this thing was at like seventy three thousand. i want to say a week ago so bitcoin getting kind of crushed let's go ahead and bring in dennis dennis how are we doing this morning we're doing good it's a choppy market to, to say the least here today. We've kind of been all over the place. We were down last night and then maybe there's no, you know, escalations really here this morning. So the market has been coming back higher and UNH comes to save the day and balances the XLV big time here. So you're seeing earnings actually are pretty good. Morgan Stanley too. We're going to get to those pretty much right away. But, you know, just to recap yesterday, we were very skeptical of the rally. I talked about thinking that this rally was going to be sold yesterday morning while well, they came in with their selling shoes on right at the opening bell and they did not relent pressure all day long losing over 100 S&P points by the end of the day it was predictable when you get a you know a, a ugly move like we had on Friday and then you get the immediate snapback money managers like thank you very much give me some of my money back they were taking the money back and then they were just raising cash so they're worried, you know, about the Middle East situation. They're worried about the Fed's trajectory for interest rate cuts. Lots of things to worry about. And they're worried, you know, that the economy may actually start to slow down. So lots of worries there. I think bounces are still to be sold. Bears are in complete control here, especially on the IWM, which isn't even bouncing this morning. You think, wow, nice little bounce here today. S&Ps are trading up. You can thank UNH for a lot of that. But IWM having none of it trading down again. TLT just goes down every single day relentlessly. It's down here again this morning in a free fall here now. And obviously that's giving you your trajectory for longer term rates, which means that they're going higher right now. So actually when you lift up and you look under the hood here and you think, oh, nice little S&P bounce here this morning, when you really look up the hood, it isn't that great. Yeah, and to your point about you know money managers and institutional investors, I mean, we know what retail investors do, right? We buy, 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 buy. We buy the dip. Sure. We buy every two weeks when we get our paychecks. You know, I mean, that's just what we do. But um, you know, for for money managers, it's one thing to have interest rates at five percent when everything's ticking along and stocks are going up and the economy looks great. Because then I think if you're a money manager, you can still justify buying stocks and having your clients be exposed to equities. But the more uncertainty increases, the more that five percent looks pretty attractive, right? As a money manager, sure. because at the end of the day, you know, a lot of money managers that you talk to will tell you, oh, my job isn't to outperform the market or to get 10% a year. My job is to preserve my client's capital. And so, again, when you have an increase in uncertainty and then you got this big safety net right here, that safety net starts to look a little bit better. I, I mean, as longer term rates go up and I was the same thing, you know, last year I had sold, I had a lot of preferred stocks that were yielding five, six, 7%, my long term portfolio. I sold all those, you know, and that's probably why I had more cash, you know, than even, you know, because I, because when you have preferred stock, it's pretty much like stock, 
like you're you like it when you're calculating it you know it looks like you got stock even though it's preferred stock which is a hybrid of obviously bonds and stock but i've sold a lot of those because i'm like why go into corporate preferreds at five and a half six percent when i get five and a half six percent in cash so that's what gets hit in the utility stocks we talked about that same type of deal you're in there for five six seven percent for some yield well you're getting that in cash so why bother with there too so you know it's just an al asset allocation thing as rates go higher it does become an alternative we already said you know tina there is no alternative well that is not the case anymore there are alternatives everywhere to stocks and cash is a decent alternative here too now again if you're all cash and you had the s p back in october and it rallied 30 percent you're sitting there making two two or three percent over that period you're like wow i really missed out and i think there's going to still be some of that and i think you're going to see people coming in and buying the dip and they attempt to buy every dip i mean we're up here again this morning on the s p as they attempt to buy every dip but Give a perspective. You know, we did this yesterday. We'll do it again today. It feels like Groundhog Day today. It probably is because we rallied yesterday morning thinking, oh, yeah, you know, dip gets bought. Just buy the dip blindly. Well, those people who bought the dip yesterday were punished severely. So now we look. They're buying the dip here again. Well, uh, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. I'm not coming in and buying the dip here this morning saying we're ripping up to 510, 512, 515 back on the spy. Because you know what? Bears are back in control. We're breaking trend. We've had a hell of a run. I think we could have that 10% correction here. We're only off, what, 2%, 3% from the highs here, AB? I mean, yesterday was the majority of the sell-off. We were only off 1% basically coming in a few days ago here. So now we're off 3%. If we got down and be down 10%, let's just do the fun math. Just do it on SPY because everybody trades at 524. We're on like 450. Four, four, 475. I mean, oh, I, okay. To, from from the highs, okay, not ten percent from here. Yeah. So I mean, highs. so say four seventy five, and I think that's a logical spot to start adding like a lot of stocks back in your portfolio. I think you could get it. I don't know if you're going to get it. Nobody has a crystal ball. There, it's going to be. It's not going to go straight down there. We always have, you know, the chop and everything else. But right now, we're in a cooling period for the market. You know, let's you know take advantage of that cooling period and just play the chop. You know, selling rips and buying dips. Maybe we're back into that, but more of the sell and rips types. Like I'm shorting rips as opposed to just blindly coming in and buying the dip. Yeah. And I mean, right now, when you look at the chart of the SPY over the last five years, we've really only had two major corrections. The first was the COVID, you know, crash, yeah. which was basically all bought back and made up those gains within a few months. Uh, and then of course in, in, uh, you know, 2022, uh, was it was it like, that was a tough time. I mean, the market did not perform well for a very, you know, for like over a year. It took us a, a while to get back up until the most recent breakout to make new all time highs. Um, so, again, like probably due for some sort of a pullback and a correction. And I like, Dennis, your outlook and saying that if we do get this 10 percent correction, it probably is a buying opportunity because I just see so much of. Uh, you know, the doom and gloom type stuff where it's like, oh, two red days in a row. That's it. Market That's crash. We're market going back crashing. to 50%. Ignore that. <laughs> no, like it's, it's, it's fine to have a pullback and maybe, okay, 10%. Maybe that's a little bit, you know, more than a lot of people are comfortable stomaching when you're looking at your long-term portfolios. Um, but to your point, like if we do get that, probably a buying opportunity. I mean, you should see if we see that happen, a 10% correction in the S&P 500, you should start to see some attractive valuations in your big boy tech stocks. I, mean, I don't think we get that 10% correction without your NVIDIAs, without your Apples, without your Microsofts falling a significant amount. So if we start to see that and I start seeing a forward PE on Microsoft of, say, 25 compared to 30, I'm going to start look. I'm going to that's going to start looking pretty attractive to me. Well, that's just it. You know, we just stretched valuations on a lot of stocks a bit too much. There's going to be a buying opportunity here. And we're not on this show at all saying we're crashing and burning. And, you know, this is it. Sell all the stocks. The end is near. The asteroids coming and blowing Pullbacks are healthy. I, 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 what's that? I said pullbacks are healthy. You can't go. Well, that's it. Day. In every single market. And Ryan Dietrich, stat man. We love stat man. Tweeting it out yesterday. I don't have the stat, but I read it go by. And he was talking about, you know, in the majority, I, I think it was like over half of, you know, markets that get a 10% correction every single year. So we're not talking about the end of the world. We're not talking about a crash. We're talking about a market that went up 30% in six months, correcting 5 to 10%. That doesn't sound absurd. It sounds healthy to, to, to you, to me too. 
A, B. And you know what? You got to like, you know, take advantage of those opportunities. If you're always eternally buying the dip in your long-term portfolio, you're probably doing pretty well. Now, as a trader, we don't have that luxury to just buy every dip and then start taking heat and, you know, just hold on. The market's eventually going to come back. A lot of retail traders do that. And that is a mistake because what you end up with, you know, sometimes like a Rivian or something, you know, where the stock goes from 120 to 8. And you're like, well, it's come back to 121 day. I'll just hold on until it comes back. No, it ain't ever coming back. And it might go to zero. So, I mean, there's certain stocks, you know, that you can buy the dip on. Probably a lot safer to play on. We know our mega caps like Apple probably not going to zero. Microsoft probably not going to zero. We say probably because nothing is obviously 100% certainly always. But a lot safer than if you're just coming and playing some Kathy stock, you know, that has the potential to go to zero. So I think just if you're a long-term investor, you're buying good companies with reasonable valuations. If you're a trader, you're playing this chop. And if I'm a trader today, I'm probably... You know, it, it's a little early. We lost 100 points yesterday. So if you just sell, you know, 10 points up, you will be up 40 on you. And you're still kind of in the downtrend here. You know, wait for us to maybe come back to trend, get a little bit of a pop, and then, you know, use that opportunity to maybe initiate some shorts or sell some more longs. Yeah, and it's, I think it, you made a good point there, you know, when you're bringing up Rivian. It's like when you're talking about that strategy of just blindly buying, you know, say you do a, a recurring investment every two weeks when you get your paycheck. That strategy over time works exceptionally well. Actually, outperforms a lot of of like actively managed hedge funds. But when you're buying the overall market, when you're buying VU or when you're buying SPY, in sure. fact, Dennis, when I have friends that come to me, you know, my age that are 26, 27, and they say like, I, I I'm starting to make a little bit more money now. I want to start investing. What I have them do is I have them download a brokerage set up a recurring investment for whatever they can afford 50 100 bucks twice a month put it into vu and the reason i do vu instead of spy is just because it has a lower expense ratio and then i have them delete the app i say just delete the app don't even look at it and then open it up in 10 years and you'll thank me and yeah, there's no reason maybe you got you do have periods of 10 years and everybody's got this i i remember hearing this chart from my banker saying there's been no period you know more than 10 years where the market has been down um well I don't know if that's totally the case. 20 years. Which 20, market, 20 years. Depends on which market you're looking at, too. Like, what is your market in the C as well? But well, there's VU. Is the S&P 500? Which, yeah. So if you just do an S&P 500, I mean, I, I again, Dow, I believe, was 68 to 80. I think it was 11 or 12 years in there. I may be wrong. But yeah. you know, overall, usually after 10 years, you're usually doing better, AB, to your point. You're usually doing better yeah. if you stick well, with if the we, if we have, If we have a 10-year period where the market isn't up, then there's probably other stuff going maybe they don't have a job anymore because everyone's gotten laid off so they, they got other people to be mad at and not me and i'll be okay in that situation or but, we went through a crisis i mean obviously we yeah. had the tech bubble burst where the nasdaq was down from 2001 and you know we tried to reclaim those highs back in 2006 but then the financial crisis happened and i believe the nasdaq didn't you know had an over 10 year period where it before it reached new highs and then we know it blasted off from there with all the tech revolution that we've had in the last five years but this goes to show you Long-term investing does work, folks. You know, the market crashes usually are short-lived or, you know, they last, it can last a couple of years in the financial crisis. And sometimes, you know, it does take a few years to get those losses back. But overall, if you're buying good companies, reasonable valuations, you'll be okay. All right, let's get into earnings uh, this morning. We, like I mentioned at the top of the show, we had some big boys report this morning. Let's start with Bank of America. Bank of America uh, reported EPS 83 cents, beat the 77 cent estimate. Sales came in at 25.81 billion, beat the 25.46 billion dollar estimate. Uh, started talking about the uh, uh, interest rate, the income from interest rates uh, being better than expected. Which, like, I don't even know how that's the. We all know the interest rates, like, uh, you know, I mean, the, you, we we know the banks are making some money there. So either way, they they seem to outperform there a little bit. But the stock, uh, I mean, again, kind of like in line with what we saw from other banks last week. They it reported good numbers, uh, but the stock's not trading up too much. Up thirty, or it's at thirty six bucks. Was at, closed at thirty five uh, ninety five yesterday. So up five cents this morning. Um, but again, I mean, I think if you're talking about the largest consumer bank in the United States, you'd rather see them, you know, beat earnings than miss. Um, but we had you had some other uh, financial stocks report this morning as well. Morgan do Stanley. Morgan too. Do Morgan with it. Yeah, yeah Morgan is up three point four percent. Morgan reported uh, EPS 
of $2.02, beat the $1.68 estimate. Sales came in at $15.13 billion, beat the $14.3 billion estimate. Uh, different types of companies here. Again, Morgan has way more exposure to the wealth management world, whereas Bank of America, I mean, Bank of America does too through its Merrill, they, when they bought Merrill. Um, but Morgan Stanley, again, is like a lot of wealth management. Bank of America has a lot of consumer banking. I bank with the Bank of America, and I actually have an investment account with Morgan Stanley. So I got both these companies uh, I'm using, I'm customers of. But either way, uh, Morgan getting a little bit more love this morning, up three bucks. And again, Morgan got hit last week. Let's pull up the daily chart from that news yeah. that was getting investigated uh, yeah. by the SEC. So uh, seeing some of that uh, gap filled here, we were trading at about 95 bucks on Morgan before that headline came out from the investigation, now right at 90 bucks. So this should, this will be an important level, and I mean I'm no I'm no Joel O'Connor, but looking at this kind of little toppy pattern that don't look great, but let's see if we can kind of break out up here. Uh, again, in the SEC, and we don't know how far you know who else involved. This was an article from the Wall Street Journal last week, but this has not gone away. This issue, and now you no. get a snapback rally for Morgan Stanley on an earnings report that's decent. Um, obviously, Goldman Sachs, you know, also you know reported really good earnings and held on. I'd rather own the Goldman than the Morgan because I don't know if more headlines emerge from this investigation here. And now you get the snapback where everybody you know that got hit last week on that is getting their money back. I'm inclined to sell this rally in Morgan Stanley. You know, Bank of America isn't rallying at all, so there's really no trade there. But you're up here back at resistance up in this whole 90 area where we broke down from. I think there's going to be some happy campers at 90, 91, 92, happy to get their money back from last week saying, hey, this investigation didn't go away. It's just, you know, not being highlighted here at this time. That you know, There could still be more headlines that emerge from that. Maybe it's a nothing burger and, you know, maybe the stock pops after that. But that's still a cloud over the stock. I think I'm selling the Morgan Stanley pop. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's I, I like I said, the chart doesn't look great to me. I mean, you look at Morgan's. I mean, all these companies, when you look at them, like the fundamentals look good. They're cheap. They've got, you know, price to sales, 2.8 forward P.E. of 13 and a half. Banks have always been cheaper, though. The banks have always that's not, had. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. When they you look can't at the, look and say, "Oh, it's going to expand 18, 15, you know, 25, 30 times," it's not going to happen. And then what you have also is, you know, the the kick in the can down the road and the interest rate cuts. I mean, all the banks want lower interest rates. Your investment banking, you know, is not as great when their interest rates are higher. There's projects that are getting killed. You know, we've talked about you know, the solar, and we've talked about, but the banks get hit too. The regionals get hit harder. But the majors get hit as well. So they want lower rates as well. When you see the TLT going straight down, it is not good for banks. You know, they are linked at the hip here. TLT going down here, bank stocks going down with the TLT because they want lower rates. And we see the best of breed JP Morgan sitting at the lows. It doesn't make me hungry to go buy the non the banks that aren't best of breed. And Morgan Stanley is definitely not best of breed. Yeah. Uh, well, let's talk about, you know, another stock that had gotten beaten up going into its earnings report and outperformed on earnings. You know where I'm going, Dennis? UNH. Yes, sir. So UNH obviously got hammered uh, last week on the past couple of weeks. Really, I mean, this thing was a $550 stock got down to 440 in the span of uh, the, you know, really all this year while all other stocks seem to be or at least all other big stocks seem to be going up. Uh, on that news that the uh, government was not changing the way like Medicare was uh, going and uh, all, all the healthcare companies, insurance companies were expecting that, didn't get it. That was hurting them. But then UNH outperformed earnings this morning. Let me go ahead and get the numbers pulled up here. But trading higher by 35 and a half bucks, up 8%. EPS came in at 691, beat the 662 estimate. Sales came in at 99.7 billion, beat the 99.2. Um, they reaffirms full year adjusted EPS outlook. So I think that's, you know, a, a lot of what people are looking at was they were expecting United Healthcare, you know, what one of, if not the biggest insurance company to be yeah. saying, okay, this, you know, this change or, or lack thereof change in how the Medicare rates are, are being determined by the government is going to hurt us. Instead, they said, no, we're going to be fine. We're still going to do as much money. We're still going to make as much money as we anticipated. Uh, and I think the market likes that because obviously, if the stock got beat up under the assumption they were going to be making less money. And then now they're saying, no, we're going to be making the same amount of money. The stock's going to then come back a little bit. So uh, seeing that dip get bought here up again, 
uh, about 8% this morning. I mean, you can just see this huge green candle on the daily chart here. It might be the ultimate buy the dip stock. It seems like when UNH goes down, and especially on this Medicare news that we get, it seems like twice a year at least they drop hard on them. They always seem to drop on this news too. It seems like, <clears throat> well, i losing my breath. It seems like um, these are usually buying opportunities. Now, again, the earnings bail it out. It's bailing out a lot of shareholders. So I don't think I'm coming in buying it up 35 bucks. It's trying to fill the gap. So that gap down from, I believe that Medicare news was two weeks ago, gap down from 490. Actually, the lower of the gap is 488 all the way down to four. I'm just trying to eyeball on the chart, 463. So you got that 63 to 88 gap there. That's where it's in right now. So you would naturally think it wants to fill that. So I would think, I don't know if it's already been up there. I wasn't looking at the chart on this one. It's been to 488 or not yet. Um, but if you can scroll, maybe you can get in there a little bit bigger and we can see. Wait, do you want to go to, you want to go to like a hourly chart? Sure. Let's do that. Let's okay. just see that. Okay. So we're still on the upswing. It's, it's, it gives you a better feel for what's really going on in the pre-market. So they're still buying this thing right now. I think you got room to 488. I think it stalls out up there. So there might be another six or seven bucks in here, but I'm not chasing it at this point in time. And again, I'm never one to buy the rip. I'm always like, okay, well, I like the stock. I'll wait for a dip to buy. Oh, I don't like the stock. I'll wait for a rip to short. That's my natural thought, you know, thought process with all my trading. Yeah, I just, I just don't love this industry, like the health. Well, industry. it's, 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 you know, obviously, you know, it's more defensive. So people like to own these stocks because they get a little bit of a dividend. They think it's not related to the economy whatsoever, which is probably true. You know, these stocks kind of just trade on their own and over the course of time. But, you know, there's also a political issue here coming too. you know, we've got an election this year. You know, that can change things. Obviously, you know, always the health insurers are always, you know, a big part of, you know, the policy outlook for both administrations there. So that's an issue as well. And sometimes they start talking about getting your health care premiums down, you know, as you start getting a political talk. And even though that never happens, it spooks these stocks sometimes too. So just keep that in mind. It's not going into a great historical time for stocks like UNH. So I think you're using this rally to maybe trim up a little bit here. I don't think it's going back to 540 anytime soon. Uh, but it is a stock that, you know, over the course of long-term portfolio performance here, this one does fairly well. Yeah, and again, I think like I and I do own some of this stock in my managed portfolio at, at Morgan, but I mean, I just like again, I think like long term, I do think you have some political risk there that eventually, you know, how we do healthcare in the United States is going to change as more and more. I mean, what's crazy is that you know people act like it, it's such a fr you know I don't want to say like fringe issue, but like people act like wanting something more similar to what you have in Canada, Dennis, is some like radical leftist want in the United States. But that's what most Americans, you look at any poll out there, most Americans want there to be uh, change and reform in this space. And I mean, going back to the uh, 2020 Democratic primary, when it looked like Bernie Sanders was going to win against Joe Biden after Nevada and after Iowa and all this stuff, it was really before uh, South Carolina, Bernie like looked like the the favorite in that race, these right. stocks were getting hammered because they were all so worried what's going to happen to this industry if he wins. What happens when a candidate like that eventually does become the nominee? I mean, I think you have to worry about, uh, you know, long term with these industries if there are. And I mean, I don't know. I think I always think things are going to stay the same rather than, than there being radical change. But I think eventually, you know, I'm talking 15, 20 years down the road, eventually there's going to be enough people being like, hey, why are we why are we the only country in the world doing healthcare this way? Um, so, again, I just don't love this like industry holding it long term. Well, I say that as I'm, I'm holding the stock. But again, I'm, that's in a managed portfolio. But again, not to get too political. I just that's why I don't really like just love this stock long term. But it's a monster. And like you said, ultimate buy the dip stock. Yeah. Any, any dip you got, you can probably buy it on. Uh, moving on to another. Well, uh, we can't ever say that, you know, like we're never going to be buying any dip. You can just buy them randomly on any dip and you're going to make money. Things can change, you know, healthcare, you know, but this is more of a political stock than anything. So I, I don't think it's the right time right now for UNH. Like, I think it's a nice pop here today. It's a nice pop on earnings. I think I would be using that pop to sell, to trim the position right now. Long, long term. Yeah, you're right. You know, like buy good companies, reasonable valuations. UNH is a good company. Yep. Uh, okay. Another company, uh, at least somewhat in the medical space, Johnson and Johnson reported this morning as well. Uh, not getting as much love down about four tenths percent. EPS came in at two bucks and 71 cents beat the $2 and 64 cent estimate sales came in at 21.38 billion missed 
the $21.39 billion estimate. They talked about some strength in their med tech sure. sales. Uh, or wait, actually. Oh, but the, okay. So they had good numbers in their med tech sales, but then they lowered guidance as or J and J sets guidance below consensus as med tech underperforms. I saw a headline earlier saying uh, Johnson and Johnson tops quarterly profit estimates as medical device sales jump was the CNBC headline. So some yeah, conflicting, wow. some conflicting uh, viewpoints there on, uh, on, on the med, what's going on in med tech, but maybe it was that the numbers for the previous quarter were good, but going forward, they're expecting those numbers to kind of, uh, retreat a little bit. So either way, Johnson and Johnson, I mean, this is, is never really been a big mover to begin with, but you know, moving, moving slightly lower this morning. Um, and, and on this show, we've hated Johnson and Johnson for a while here now because of the talc issue. We, you know, we've obviously seen, you know, that there's, you know, this lawsuits are still pending over this stock. I, 175, I said, you know, this stock may be one of the stocks that, you know, could get hit, you know, significantly here because of these issues. They haven't gone away and stocks didn't get the lows. If they didn't have the talc issues, the stock would probably be up, be up near the highs. But, you know, it's still there. They're settling it as it goes. But, you know, there's still, you know, like I'm just even Googling through the headlines, like they're trying to settle, but there's so many cases out here. So this issue still is not gone away. You know, you would think like this, like 3M, you know, with the earplug issue, you keep thinking it's going to go away as they're doing little settlements here. But there's still just so many, you know, lawsuits outstanding here, 40,000 of them, you know, outstanding. So this is just such a major issue. It's just, it's just a headwind for the stock. So is it a good company? It's a really good company. Is it a reasonable valuation? It gets getting more reasonable every day. Is there a certain point in time where, you know, the risks, you know, the return outweighs the risk, you know, the risk of the talc issue? I think so. Um, I still think, you know, this talc issue is still holding on here, though, and they're still trying to settle and they're still doing settlements. It's just taking a long time and it's going to be there for a while here yet. So, you know, if the stock got down to 120 and I know that people are like, what are you talking about? Johnson Johnson 120. I think it becomes a lot more attractive. But, you know, we just think about the weight that the earplug issues put on 3M and the stock still can't find its way. Like the 3M valuation is nothing short of like almost ridiculous at this point in time. Like the earplug issues must be such an issue for the stock to be trading. Like go to your trusty Benzinga Pro, bring up the PE on 3M. And 3M is a company that makes, you know, everything. The PE is 10. And there's no companies in its industry trading 10. The industry average is like up in the 30s. So, I mean, the reason 3M trades with a PE of 10 is that they still don't have clarity on how big the, 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 the lawsuits are going to be and how much it's going to cost them to settle all these. And some people are saying the company can end up going bankrupt from it all. Well, the stock performance, you know, doesn't say different really that, you know, when you're trading 10 times earnings and stock's gone from 250 to 91 and the earnings itself have been, you know, it's not like the earnings, you know, have just been a disaster and this is earnings driven story. This is a story driven by potential lawsuits. So this stock, again, 3M, J&J, still clouded because we just don't have full clarity on how much these lawsuits are going to cost. Yeah, and I think that's like, you know, when you get this big as 3M or Johnson & Johnson and you're in all these different industries, I mean, you know, you 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 put yourself at risk for, get, you know, some of these lawsuits. And when you have, you know, just in uh, your hands in all these different things, as opposed to kind of like mastering one lane. I mean, Johnson & Johnson, you look at it, whether it's baby powder, med tech sales, shampoo, like it's, a, it's everything I feel like. And, everything. Uh, uh, you know, consumer staples. So people view it as safer, but it becomes less safe to your point, Dennis, when you have these things uh, hanging overhead. So. Uh, I don't know. Let's look at the daily chart real quick here on Johnson and Johnson. I mean, not looking great. I mean, you hit a top here at 186 back in May of 2022. Haven't been able to really get back there. And to me, like, not that anything's black and white or always so simple, but just it's always a red flag to me when you have a stock that like ha is in such a downtrend while the overall market has been doing so well because you really at that point have no other excuse like you can't blame market conditions you can't blame interest rates it's really just comes down to we're out of favor and look like a lot of these people managing the money and buying and selling stocks are smarter than me you're out of favor for a reason and, and the reason is talc and this is the one thing i want to use this as a lesson because so many people start with the chart to do their long-term investment thesis start with the fundamentals and then look at the chart for timing fundamentals are first what we said on this show, and you can go back to last year, 
was I th- I'm concerned about Johnson and Johnson at 175, 180. The stock was making new all time highs. Every technician would be saying to me, Are you nuts? Look at this chart. Why in the hell would I sell anything like this? This stock's a monster. Why? Because the talc issues are coming. You know, we saw that one settlement, you know, that was $19 million and there's 40,000 of them. I'm like, Well, this is an issue. So this is just going to show you so many people are so focused, so focused on charts, technicals. This is how you make money. It's all about the charts. It's all about the charts. I will tell you, my 24-year trading career, if I relied just on charts, my trading career would have been a lot less than 24 years. Charts are awesome tools for timing, but you still got to think about you know the story. You got to think about the fundies. It all matters, folks. You know, GameStop's breaking out, you know, making new all-time highs. You're like, the technicals look great. Let's go. And, you know, and that can work. And, you know, you break the moving averages and you get out. And, you know, there's some very good technical traders out there. But I'll tell you who the best traders are, the ones that do the combo approach, the ones that can combine the technicals with the fundamentals, you know, combining the story. Because if you were just trading Johnson Johnson on technicals a year and a half ago, you'd been long and you would have got hurt. But if you were listening to the show and you were looking and reading the headlines and people say, oh, yeah, you read the headlines. Eventually, you're just delivering the newspapers. Stupidest quote ever. I have made my living trading headlines headlines matter folks if you're a trader and you're not looking at headlines you're an idiot when there was a stock recently we were talking about the last couple weeks where you know we talked about how the technicals were looking one way then you got a headline and all of a sudden the technicals are out the window and it was you know the headline trumped the the technicals every time they always i mean it might have been apple that the apple technicals didn't look great and then we got the apple headline and that you know next thing you know it's up four percent in a day um, I haven't checked on Apple in a while. Cause News my- drives everything. Like you think, oh, I don't care about the economic numbers. Well, why do you think the markets are on? Right? Housing starts just came out. You know, like the economic numbers matter here too. It all matters. Now, as a long-term investor, you can ignore the headlines if you want. So I was speaking, I was speaking to the traders when I was talking in that context. You can ignore them. You know, to, you don't need to care about every little long-term headline or you would shake out of your entire long-term investment portfolio. But as a trader, if you want to be a career trader and it's your job, the first lesson I would give you is headlines matter. They absolutely do. They drive the bus. You got to know when the company's reporting earnings. You know, it's all about the headlines. So like when you're sitting here and people are like, I don't pay for news. I get it all on Twitter. Well, that's why you're behind me, folks. That's why you're behind because you're not paying for news. You know, whether it's Benzinga Pro or whatever you want to use, I think Pro is a great value. I think, you know, you get the good bang for the buck. You get the right, you know, you can get all the press releases right there. Boom. We've got, you know, the Pro team working on it. You know, you don't have to pay $2,500 for a Bloomberg. I think it's a fantastic alternative, you know, at, at a lot, lot cheaper price. But, you know, it's all, all about, you know, headlines as a trader. And headlines do matter. Uh, someone asking what housing starts is. I think that's just exactly what it sounds like. Is how many house how, how many houses? One point three two million versus one point four seven million estimates. So it came in a little bit light. I guess when they come in light, that's good news here, AB. You know, because they want the economy to slow down a little bit, so it can possibly get lower rates this year. We don't want to see anything hot. Nothing hot. Hot or not, they want the not right now. You know that thing. Remember that thing they had hot or not? You sweep left right or whatever the hell it was. Anyways. They want all not right now. No, I think someone in the, the chat knots. was asking though what that what the stat means, and I think it's just exactly what it sounds like. How many houses do they start building? But I mean, it, that makes well, kind of no sense when you think about it, Dennis, because we've talked about now with a number of different economists, whether it's Blue or uh, you know whoever else, that you know housing prices, shelter prices have been one of the main drivers of inflation, and that's something where demand doesn't really you know uh, you know drop that much. People need to live somewhere and if you have less supply that should help elevate housing prices so uh i mean obviously this is a lot down the road so maybe it's it's a slow down to your point dennis is what they're what they're looking at and why the the market rallied a little bit on that but uh again if the supply is is limited and then that should help keep housing prices higher which is what we don't need in terms of inflation falling but uh yeah i mean Maybe you are finally starting to see some of this economic slowdown that people have been expecting now for two years. Even the guy in charge of all of this, Powell, has been saying unemployment's going to go higher. We're going to see pain in the labor market. And, you know, he said that, you know, a year and a half, two years ago, and we never saw it. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to act like I know where the economy is going if the guy in charge of it doesn't even know. 
Yeah, well, and it's difficult. Um, you know, like we nobody has a crystal ball here, and every time we get an economic, then economic data has never mattered like this. Like two years ago, you trade, four years ago, you trade economic data. It didn't matter as much. Right now, it really matters because the, the, there's certain, and obviously, it matters on what you're trading as well, which we've talked about too. You know, you see the vicious rotation, but you know, when the TLT just relentlessly going down here every day, I mean, I maybe you can ignore some of these economic numbers and just look at the TLT. Like the long term rates are going higher, folks. I did not have that on my on, on my play card here for 2024. The long-term rates would start exploding again this year. I thought long-term rates were going to go lower. I thought the Fed, you know, was had a path and we we're going to start interest rates coming down. Now we're not even talking about any cuts at all. So as long as you see a hot number, you know, that's not going to be good for stocks. But, you know, the cooler number, housing starts is just a nothing burger, though. And that's why the TLT isn't responding to it. So we get a little pop in the stocks. It's like, oh, something's light, but... TLT is the lie detector. We've talked about this before. The breakdown in TLT through 92 was your signal to get the hell out of stocks. That was your signal. That happened 10 days ago. S&Ps were at the highs. That was your signal to get the hell out of stocks. And you know what? It's down here at 88 here now. Not making, not bouncing really here at all. Next support on the TLT is probably down around the 86 level, 85 level. So, I mean... It's all about bonds and rates. And we talked about that, you know, a divergence that was happening a couple of weeks ago where TLT and the, but IWM's going up. And I'm like, can the IWM rally without the TLT? It can for a few days, but we can see in the long run it cannot. And TLT is now winning and IWM is giving it all back. And IWM actually, I believe, is now trading red on the year, which is impressive considering how far um, you know, the S P is up. So with TLT trading close to red on the year, yeah, it is. It's down on the year. That's impressive. Got it. Well, all right. It is 8.37 a.m. Eastern. We've got Derek Oldensmith from T3 Trading hanging out backstage. Let's go ahead and give Derek our pre-market prep welcome and see what he's been watching when we get back. All right, Derek, how you doing this morning? Hey, good morning. Great to be back. How you guys doing? Yeah, welcome back on the show. We're doing well, trying to digest all this market volatility. Of course, two big red days, Monday and Friday, getting that VIX up a little bit higher, some more chop. What have you been watching, man? This market got kind of exciting recently, didn't it? Yeah. It's about time after that slow grind up for months and months and months. We got some excitement with that VIX pop for sure. Uh, I'm very focused on the market itself right now. Whenever the entire market becomes in play, this becomes kind of my cue for everything that I do. Uh, it's interesting nice. that we saw a couple really heavy sell days in a row and the market pre-market at one point this morning when we were when we were negative, when I, when I woke up nice and early to start my pre-market trading, we uh, were starting to approach what I consider to be more extreme extension to the downside right now. And that's into a massive support level for the SPY, which is this 503. If you remember back on all the way back, when everything was was rosy on uh, February 22nd, that's when NVIDIA last reported earnings. And the entire market had that huge gap up. The low of the SPY on that day is 503 spot 02. And pre-market this morning, 503 spot 10. So we got, you know, like a third day gap down potentially at one point this morning. Again, now we're up into this huge support level. I'm like, all right, this is a spot here. Where I think I need to take a little bit of a stand on the longs to see if I can get at least some sort of bounce trade. And then to me, the more interesting part about this market is going to be after we get a bounce. The, the market right now still has the potential to just kangaroo all the way back up. If the VIX wants to come back down and you get some of that systematic buying to come back into the market. And next thing you know, we're, we're right back where we were. But if we bounce off of this more oversold area that we're in right now, create another lower high and then break that 503. I think that that is when we are potentially in a lot more trouble. And that also will be a spot where I think that we'll begin to see even more systematic selling from funds come into the market. And then you got to watch out a little bit. So very, very short term right now, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a bounce. I got my little shopping list out this morning sure. on some stocks that are very oversold. But what does that bounce turn into, I think, is the, the the key question at this point. You have that shopping list handy? Like, what stocks are you looking at here, Derek, that you think are oversold? Because a lot of people are interested in buying the dip. Sure. So there are some names that are that have gotten super beaten up, probably more with the interest rate move than anything else. I think got a jump start on the down move before the market itself did because 
market's always being held up by those usual suspects. I got a few on my list that have been totally beaten up, a few of which I'm, I'm already in, a couple I'm looking at that I'm not in. Uh, you know, just so everyone knows if I'm talking my book or not, I am in this uh -huh. one already, um, which is the old overstock, which is now beyond BYON. Uh, this thing has just gotten annihilated this month from $36 down wow. to 2450 uh, this wow. morning. It's, I don't know, eight down days in a row. There's a lot of extension. Yeah. It's into the 200 day. There's some support in this $24, $25 area. So if the market can bounce a little bit, I've got, I've got that one on the list. One that I'm not in, but I'm watching at this point is AI. Haven't traded this name in a while, but this is another one that's just been destroyed wow, some of these uh, stocks yeah some of you these know, names are wrecked Absolutely you look wrecked. at the s p derek and you like you don't see this story here what you see is you know oh yeah you know we're pulling a little two three percent correction here it doesn't feel bad this stock just got cut in half i mean almost yeah. cut in half like 40 percent. so there is a little bit of hidden carnage here when you start getting away from that mega cap trade right exactly exactly and and, and all i'm looking for here is I'm not looking to buy AI at 20 for a move back to $38 at this point where it was in the beginning of March. I want to see if I can scoop up a RDR type of trade. It's one of the trades my team and I look for uh, to basically buy this thing on the way up, see if I can get a bounce back to more of its equilibrium zone, which I would say is a space between like $23 and $25. It could present a good risk reward opportunity as the spies maybe make a stand at that 503 area with some extension. And then at that point, I wanna probably book the vast majority of my profits, maybe keep a little bit just in case that retracement higher actually becomes a reversal, but then really reassess at that point, are we getting that lower high with the market? In which case, watch out, make sure you booked your profit, or do we kangaroo all the way right back up, which I do think the market still has the potential to do that if we can get through some of these more macro headwinds. There's a couple. Um, anything else there in, 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 on your watch list? Unity, another one wrecked over the oh, course of this year. Part of the year at $42. It broke 25 support yesterday. So 25 is a really big level on this thing. Again, I, I don't want to be catching a falling knife in any of this stuff, but if I can buy uh, the way back up, maybe on the way back up through that 25 level, you don't have the same degree of extension, I don't think, in this Unity as the others uh Sentinel one is another one that i've, I've traded a lot oh, yeah with. you gave us that one and it was really good actually you like the single like... the single letter tickers you <laughs> yeah. just... and derek gave us this one as a great call he gave us this one back at like 17 or 18 like i think it was in the fall and right. you know the stock obviously went to 30 so it's almost round tripped it here now so you're looking back at that 17 18 level maybe reload reload yeah, 20 is a big level. There's a big gap fill there if you go back to the beginning of December on an earnings report that uh, in, into 20, same thought process here. You got the 200 day at $20.60. You got $20 as some potential support. You've got extension to the downside. It's a day three down with the market support. I want to see if I can get a bounce rate out of these things at this point. There is some carnage out there and I think it's okay to have a little bit of a shopping list to try to take advantage of that at certain points. But at the yeah. same time, don't marry these things at this point. Yeah, and Derek, if you have charts that you've you know drawn lines on and stuff and you have them handy and you want to pull them up, uh, feel free to do so. We also have a QR code in the bottom of the screen if you want to trade with Derek for free in his Pro Desk virtual trading floor April 16th through 19th so that is the rest of this week again we got the qr code on the screen i also threw the link in the chat it is also in the description so i'll throw that in the chat one more time if you guys want to go check that out get all of these setups uh from derek and uh and hop in his trading room yeah definitely everyone should make sure to check that out uh you know i was just thinking before we started our little conversation today about the vix right because the vix is so important right now especially because you've got so many funds that that are out there who based the amount of leverage that they have in the market just very simply based off the price of the vix they say higher volatility equals more risk and i was thinking right before we came on about about my my trading team because my trading team started on our floor our trading floor for t3 uh in new york city and i spent 10 years there before covid and now we've really switched the entire team to being remote and utilizing this virtual trading floor instead but i used to do all these interviews in person and I would interview an MBA guy and I'd be like, what does risk mean to you? And they would say volatility. And I always thought that that was an interesting answer that all these MBA guys learn that risk is volatility when they were in school, because I never interpreted it that way. I always interpreted as more of a day swing trader, volatility to be opportunity. 
But now, as I understand the importance of systematic flows in the market, which I think especially over the course of the last few years has just become an increasingly important part about how markets work and how they function and, and how they're structured. And it's something that all traders should be paying attention to if they're involved in markets. I started to realize it's like, well, hmm, even if I disagree with that MBA guy and I think that higher VIX, higher volatility means more opportunity, there are all these systematic funds that are managed by MBA guys who say, oh boy, the VIX is moving higher. I need to liquidate. I need to liquidate. Wow, and that higher cool. VIX can actually create that, that, that additional selling just because, well, that's what these guys were all taught in school. Well, it's kind of like a chicken and the egg type thing as well, because you have the the selling and the the freaking out that makes the VIX go higher, and then you have you know it's like a, it's like a, a positive loop where then you the, then the VIX goes higher, and then you see the more selling and that makes the VIX go higher uh, again until again it, it hits a certain point where then people start looking at the valuations and saying, oh wow, this this looks really attractive, I got to go buy this. So uh, definitely an interesting point there, Derek. That when you that's speed what we call that's what we call a trend, right? That that's literally what it, what a trend is. It's a feedback cycle of buying or a feedback cycle of selling that right. comes into the market because trader A sells, it forces trader B to sell, which forces trader C to sell, and the next thing you know, you're you're working into that downtrend. Yeah, I always I kind of like I say it kind of jokingly, but I'm like, yeah, selling begets selling until it begets so much selling that it begets buying. Like because you get down <laughs> to a certain point, and then people are like, oh, I gotta buy it down here after the selling that you know brought all the selling. Then it gets down to a certain point, and you gotta buy it back. So, uh, Derek, I mean, right now, you know, we're talking about the VIX creeping higher. I mean, what do you think from an overall market standpoint? You think like big correction coming? You think buy the dip opportunity, or are you just taking it day by day? So I'm definitely taking it a little bit day by day. I, I think that we're at an extremely crucial point with this SPY approaching approaching 503 and with with where with where the VIX is. Uh, the VIX has stayed very low, very consistently now for over a year. And part of that is because we have all of these, again, systematic ETFs even now that JP Morgan has been starting to get their clients in to just sell vol and sell vol. And that helps keep an underlying bid in the market. So I think that we're at a really crucial point where it's like I was saying before, if we get a little bit of a bounce here, but then we lose 503 in the spies, I think that that becomes actually a trigger to see significantly more selling, but also we could snap right back. Obviously there's two main factors that are the catalysts right now. One is the geopolitical situation with Israel and Iran, and the other is just interest rates and inflation and, and, and the Fed. And the really interesting thing about those two catalysts is so relative strength and relative weakness is a really important factor in my overall trading i think depending on which catalyst is affecting the market in whichever moment you're looking at it creates a very different relative strength relative weakness dynamic because it seems to me that when the forefront of the selling is coming from geopolitical situation between israel and iran that that actually leads to the tlt getting bought up a little bit as a fear trade and more weakness in the queues because that's the more expensive part of the market. That's where everybody's got their cash parked. So when I'm seeing the market selling really heavy intraday because some new headline came out on the Israel-Iran situation, and I'm looking for maybe like a quick oversold bounce trade, I'm looking more in the IWM for that oversold bounce. And the queues are acting very relatively weak in that, in that moment. But then next thing you know, maybe it's not the geopolitics that are moving the market, it's interest rates. And when it's the interest rates moving higher and the TLT getting crushed, you know, right before I came on, you guys were talking about TLT 92, which was a massively important level that we lost. When I'm seeing this TLT getting crushed, it's the absolute opposite relative strength, relative weakness dynamics. If I want to be buying anything, the cues are where the strength are because Microsoft and Apple, they don't care where interest rates are. I mean, at a certain point, if it really begins to affect the economy, which it hasn't so far, then then yeah. they'll start to care. But they're they're locked in at four for forty year debt at two percent. Does it yeah. matter to them if interest rates are at four percent or at eight percent? It doesn't matter to them at all. But it certainly matters to those small and mid cap companies that that compose the IWM. Rivian, yeah, I mean, it's gonna yep. matter. To oh, them. Yeah. Um, so. All right, well, Derek, coming up on eight fifty. Any final thoughts or trade ideas as we head into today? The final thought that I would always have for everyone who might be paying attention is no one's a perfect trader and the VIX is higher right now. And while I do think that creates opportunity, you got to remember that risk management is really the key to success in this business. So 
no matter what your thought process is, if you're like me, where you're thinking maybe you can get an oversold bounce or you're a super big bear and you think that this is just the beginning of the end and we're going to continue to go lower, you might be right. You might also be wrong. I'm wrong all the time and I do this professionally as a living. The key to success, what really separates the people who become successful from those who don't is how they manage risk when their ideas don't work out. So whatever you're thinking, make sure that you have that game plan in place just in case you happen to be wrong. That's the difference between you being successful and you not being successful. Well, Derek, again, thank you for hopping on with us today. If you want to see how Derek is managing that risk and finding some opportunities in this market, again, hit that QR code in the bottom of the screen or link in the chat. I'll drop it one more time. Uh, Derek, thanks as always for hopping on. Always great to catch up. Thanks a lot, guys. See you next time. Uh, all right, Dennis, how are we looking? Uh, are, we, are, we, are we rallying still? Are we selling off a little bit? Looking a little bit here, just chopping around here. Um, I think we're going to continue to chop around. So I don't think this is one of those markets going to go straight down, straight up. You know, I, I think we're just going to continue to chop around. I think you got to continue to play the fade trade here right now. Fade trade working in the last few weeks, selling reps. Buying dips, we're keeping those, you know, short-lived here. Obviously, the dips are a little bit more scary to buy here when you're starting to break down on so many stocks. But, you know, what Derek's saying, there has been a serious correction in a lot of stocks here. You know, when you look at Sentinel-1, there was a stock, you know, $30. It's down at 20 here now. There's a stock still cyber security. It's the old fire eye, maybe not like a crowd strike, you know, where it's kind of best to breathe there. But there's been, you know, to this point, like where we feel like we're only 2 3% off the highs in the S&P. So many other stocks have entirely different stories here. So it's a stock picker's market and there is opportunities here and there is some diamonds in the rough. Obviously, you know, if you're coming in and you're buying the dip, I do like what Derek says, you know, wait for the strength to come in as opposed to just catching the falling knife. You know, he waits for that bounce and then maybe some consolidation. I always say the hook, you know, where you got the sell off, sell off. You don't know where it's going to end. So why buy it on the whole way down? Then stops going down. Then it consolidates for a bit, but then it starts to like hook up. That's where I like to strike. Yeah, uh, we're a long ways away from that because we're still in the down phase here right now. So I'm not thinking about a lot of longs right now in my long term portfolio. Dennis, you know what one of my best trades was over the last couple of years? And uh, I, I don't really feel great about this one. I'll, uh, it was it was it, it wasn't a market trade. It was buying taylor swift tickets when they came out on the you know when i got them at face value and then resold them on which by the way was not my intention before everyone hops on me and calls me a <laughs> you know asshole maybe, or whatever whatever it was taylor swift scalper here yeah no that was not my intention i bought six tickets to the detroit show with the full intention of going how and much then, were those tickets when you bought them? So give us the whole breakdown. Give okay, the so the whole, whole breakdown. breakdown, which first of all, by the way, I also like flagged my friends and I was like, yo, these tickets are coming out. You guys should pick some up because like the demand for them is going to be crazy because I knew I was like, this is her first time touring in four years. Her album was, was coming out and like it was before kind of we saw this like huge ramp up and just Taylor Swift being everywhere. I mean, I think from like November of 2020 three when or uh yeah or no two i don't even remember what year it was now when the tickets went on sale to now like she's just gotten like way bigger somehow because she was already one of the biggest stars in the world yeah um but i told my friends like oh buy some whatever they didn't i did and i was i bought tickets to the detroit show with the intention of going i had a i bought them for i think they were like 300 bucks a pop for lower bowl at ford field they ended up selling for two thousand dollars a ticket so that's what more than six x what I paid for them. What happened was I have a golf trip that I go on every year with some of my buddies where we pick like a different destination around like the Midwest usually because a lot of them live in Chicago. And I couldn't in this group chat with a bunch of guys be like, hey guys, I can't go on the golf trip this year. I've got a Taylor Swift <laughs> concert. I think I would have gotten, you know, I oh, yeah. they, they, they would have never let me live it down. So I, I had to sell them. And at the end of the day, look, do I feel like, kind of, did I feel bad about it that I was making money on it? Sure. But that was the asking price. And at the end of the day, people that bought the tickets wanted to go. They got the experience. They're like happy. His. They got them. Yeah, exactly. So we, we, we all Everybody won. Wins. We all won, except for, you know, I mean, I, I still haven't gotten to go to a show yet. I would still like to. Um, but, you know, I'm talking about this because Live Nation is in the news again. Yeah. Uh, and, and there were talks about an antitrust suit against 
uh, Live Nation. I mean, really, like when the tickets, when this whole thing happened with Taylor Swift, you had Congress, members of Congress, AOC and stuff talking about Live Nation. This is a monopoly that needs to be broken up, this and that. And I mean, this is what happens. I mean, stuff takes a while in Congress and in, the, and in politics and stuff. So now a couple years later, we're seeing that the Justice Department will file an antitrust lawsuit against yeah. the company. And the big kicker is, I mean, I think Live Nation owns Ticketmaster or something. So you got not only do they own the venues where the concerts are at, they own where you're selling the tickets. And they really put a lot of the artists in a position where they can't go other places like uh, Zach Bryan, one of the biggest country artists right now, had a whole album called like All My Friends Hate Ticketmaster because they kind of screwed him over. <laughs> and he had an album called All My Friends Hate Ticketmaster or Screw Ticketmaster, whatever it was. And then a year later, he went on tour and guess where his tickets were being sold? Ticketmaster, because he had no other option. So I think, you know, out of all the antitrust lawsuits, so, uh, monopolies and stuff, like I think this one maybe has some legs. And stock trading down eight ninety five on it, so it's down nine bucks at nine ninety dollars and eighty cents. So it is down significantly, and people just come in and you know they randomly buy dips. I mean, everybody's like, "Ooh, I'm going to buy that dip because Live Nation." You know, concerts are still a huge money maker. Stock's going to come back eventually here. But what I say is, you know, when you're buying these dips, is maybe wait till it stops going down. It might just bounce at ninety. There's huge support there. I can see it. But I've lost a lot of money just trying to catch the falling knife maybe we should have named this show don't catch the falling knife because you know derek was somewhat warning about that but you know still looking at these falling knives but waiting till there's strength that's the key wait till there's strength so if you come into a live nation here you're looking yeah i want to buy this at 90 this is huge it's going to bounce right back to 100 they typically don't bounce right back usually they go down down a little further than you think they can and then they start to consolidate. And, you know, sometimes the consolidation is actually a move for lower. So I don't even, it's not even good enough for me to just have the consolidation. I actually want to see it start hooking higher, like where you're starting to see not only like a rounding bottom, people some call it, you know, but just, you know, and even a candle that's just showing you an outside where it's trying to get back up to the area where it just fell from. That's, you know, like reaching up, reaching up, you know, that's what I want to see. That's never going to happen on the first day. It's never going to happen the second day. So, I mean, you've got to just be careful just coming in and buying the, the dip. If, you know, the story is there and you think, you you know, you're long term, you just want to buy some here, you know, maybe you do a partial position. You just can't help yourself. I got to get in here. You know, it's down $9. I got to be a buyer. But I've lost a lot more money buying stocks $9 than buying stocks that are actually, you know, like just trading flat because it's, you know, when they go down nine, sometimes there's follow through. Yeah, I see someone in the chat saying, damn, the government really has its priorities straight. But it's like, at the end of the day, I mean, I think the, at least the goal with this, I'm not saying it always happens with these antitrust lawsuits. They're trying to protect the consumer to a certain degree. I think a lot of people have become uh, really like upset with ticket prices for concerts and sporting goods because it shouldn't cost so much to go see your favorite it's artist. It's ridiculous. Right? If you're it's a absolutely ridiculous. If, if, you're, if you're a 15, 16-year-old girl or whatever, you want to go see Taylor Swift, you don't have $2,000 to go it's do it. Not. Like, it, 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 it's, it is ridiculous. And I mean, ridiculous. at the end of the day, like, uh, entertainment costs, sure, are they auxiliary? Are they, you know, they're, they're not something we need. They're very, uh, you know, in, they're, they're very elastic. But it, at the end of the day, like, we all spend money on entertainment. So just because it's in entertainment, I don't think we should just say there should be no, you know, it, it, it's, it, it can be, you can charge whatever, you know what I mean? Like at the end of the day, like I want to be able to go to the sporting events I want to go to. I want to go be able to see a baseball game. I want to go be able to see a concert without having to take out a loan. And and that's where we're at. So I'm with, and you know, Taylor Swift has said this, you know, multiple times. Like they, she wants her, her fans to be able to afford tickets to go and see her. You know, she doesn't want this. So, you know, where where it's it's greed to a certain extent by these companies. So maybe the investigation is good. You know, maybe we've got to look at and and you know, this is everything. This is in every industry. This is capitalism, you know. There's going supply and demand. Basic, you know, your first economics course. When you go there and they draw the line, supply and demand lines, you know, and they're trying to figure out where to, you know, price something. I mean, this is where we this is what the whole, you know, economy in North America is built on is capitalism. And, you know, like this is sometimes not a good thing for the consumer, you know, and it's not a good thing that we continue to have the gap separation. It's not a good thing that half the country probably can't afford to ever go see a Taylor Swift concert and they might be huge fans, you know. So I don't know how you fix it, though. That's like I don't know if anybody knows how to fix this. Like, why am I paying three dollars and ninety nine cents for a loaf of bread, you yeah. know, where and, and where I was paying two dollars, two dollars and fifty cents. It's really tough. Like some people and, you know, like I'm, I'm pissed off to pay it, but I can afford to pay it. So you're pissed off to pay, you know, two thousand dollars or maybe you know more for these Taylor Swift. Where you were selling the tickets, but I mean, the, the person who bought them, 
can is probably pissed off they have to pay that, but they can afford to pay it. I feel bad for the people who can't afford to pay it. Right. That's well, the issue. And I, and I think, I mean, to your point, though, I think with uh, especially the when you had this increase and you people saw how much the Taylor Swift tickets were going for you, then you had an increase in people that were doing what I did, although I did it somewhat unintentionally because I, I originally was trying to go. But they, you know, then you have it, it's kind of like artificial supply and demand because you have people going in buying up the supply with the intention of making money off of it. So it's not really yeah. the exact demand of what the tickets would be. But either way, I mean, the, the people making money on all this are have been Live Nation, Taylor Swift, obviously, and all the consumers are getting screwed. So, I, you know, I'm not saying, oh, my God, the, the government should come in and cap all the prices at $200 and give everyone free ticket. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying maybe having some more regulations, more guidelines into how this is done to help protect the consumer in some way isn't necessarily a bad thing. And I, I, capitalism is a great thing. But when you have like unfettered capitalism, when you have it with no guidelines, no regulations, we, we've seen time and time again what happens and, and what ends Price up happening. Gouging. What'd you say? Price gouging. Happens. Exactly. So I think that's why I think like reason, the best case scenario for us is reasonable guidelines, reasonable regulations, and then letting capitalism do its thing. So I think hopefully that's just what we're going to see play out here either way live nation stock show getting hammered this morning so if you're in the stock i mean and you're wondering why it's down nine percent this is why and i mean it really is all you kind of all started because of this whole taylor swift thing but um all right we're, we're at 901 so unless anyone else like gives me a comment in the next 30 seconds of something huge we missed this morning we'll go ahead and yeah. wrap up we're the leaking show. substantially here on the s p um obviously you know it's one of those markets where it's going to be choppy, folks. You know, we're not going to go up straight up. We're not going to go straight down. You know, the TLT lie detector test is lower again here today. IWM is following suit and having none of this rally. SPY, you know, off that housing starts, ripped higher here and starting to leak here again. I feel like there's more pain ahead. I don't feel like, I don't even feel like the pain really got started. You know, for the S&P, sure, if you're in some of these stocks, you know, that that, that Derek was talking about, you know, that have been really beat up there. There has been some pain out there. But, you know, if you're just sitting here in the S&P and you're complaining that the market's down 2%, you're thinking, I better buy this 2% dip. Folks, we haven't even had a dip really yet. It's pretty minor. Yeah, I mean, yeah, two red days in a row brought us down about 3%. But, I mean, I think, you know, like we talked about at the top of the show, Dennis, probably due for some sort of correction. And the question is just now, is that going to be 5%? Is that going to be 10%? Or is a dip going to go out and get bought today? We'll see. We don't have a crystal ball. But, again, like, I think I would just tell – Everyone out there, if we do continue to see the markets moving lower today, try not to, you know, necessarily freak out and 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 buy into some of this stuff you may see on Twitter, like, oh, market crash going down 50%, sell everything. You want to sell everything? I mean, go ahead. But I, I, I think, again, a, a 5 to 10% correction here would be uh, somewhat healthy and that, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll survive it. There's a rare market that you're going to make a lot of money selling everything. Yep. Um, all right, Dennis. Well, good show today. 9.03 a.m. Eastern live trading will start up after this. Please smash the like and subscribe to the channel if you have not already. We'll be back tomorrow morning and uh, see you guys then.